Today on the channel is something truly special. We have Hugo Perez, the coach of El Salvador, currently going through CONCACAF World Cup qualifying on the channel to discuss everything from El Salvadorian football to Greg Berhalter and the U.S. men's national team and his thoughts around dual nationals and recruitment. I could not be more thankful and appreciative to Hugo for the time that he spent today. And as an aspiring coach myself, I think you'll want to watch the entire 45 minute interview as we go through all these topics. So guys, if you're new here or if you're not subscribed yet, make sure you're subscribed to FIFA America. I'm Jake and I just cannot be more excited to bring this to you guys. So let's get started and talk to Hugo Perez, coach of the El Salvadorian national team. Hugo Perez, my friend, thank you so much for joining the channel. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. I want to cover your time as manager of El Salvador. I know you came to my neck of the woods in England a few weeks ago. And yeah, talking through the next few games of World Cup qualifying. So thanks for joining the channel. Look, I'm thankful for your invitation and uh, looking forward to speak about soccer. Awesome. Likewise, likewise. So maybe let's just start with the El Salvador situation, and you're currently managing the team through the last three games of the World Cup qualifying window. I know in the past you've talked about 2026 as the time when El Salvador should expect to qualify for the World Cup, but you're actually still alive in qualification. You're on nine points right now. Uh, total, if you win all three of your games, could be at 18 and could potentially still be qualifying for the next World Cup. So what are your expectations for the last three games? Are you looking to still qualify, or is it still kind of about 2026? Well, I think we we discussed this with all the players. Um, basically, what needs to happen is we need to win three games, two away, one at home, and then the other two teams that are in front of us, they will probably have to lose all the games. That's the only chance we have right now. I mean, mathematically, um, I don't think we're out. But as soon as we get a tie or we lose a game, we're out. Yeah. So the players know that. So we're going to try and, and do what it's in our control. Um, and then if it happens, it happens. And God, if it doesn't, then, you know, we're like uh, in a process also of evaluating already players that are going to be continuing with us and some that are not mm -hmm. because of age and yeah. certain other things. Um, and then, you know, we, we, uh, let me put it this way. We already started what I think is going to be the beginning of the 2026 uh, program. Um, yeah. So we'll see, but we want to finish strongly for our people, for our country. Um, you know, it's been years and years that we had issues on the field, off the field. So we're trying to change that also. Yeah. I do want to ask a little bit about that because I think two years ago you gave an interview where you were talking about the infrastructure for El Salvador and trying to recruit dual nationals where maybe the players had to pay to come play for the national mm -hmm. team. Do you feel like that situation has changed now with the national team? Do you feel a bit more support in that area? Yeah, it has changed. Uh, since we came, it has changed. And we have been able to speak to some people uh, or companies to sponsor us. Right now, I think we have about seven or eight companies that are sponsoring us, which is helpful for a program. Uh, any player that we feel is good enough to come from the United States or Europe or any place, they don't have to pay a dime to come to the national team. You know, before it was a big issue. Uh, but we've changed that in the last nine months and hopefully it's going to get better going forward. That's great to hear. I mean, it was just two years ago that you were <laughs> saying that nobody, <laughs> there was no money there, that players had to pay their own way. So in two short years, that's a lot of progress that yeah. you guys have made. Awesome. Um, so on the dual national question, and you mentioned players from the U.S. or players that have a passport for El Salvador or could potentially be eligible for the El Salvador national team. As a manager trying to recruit these young players, what have you found to be the top priority to try and bring those players into the national team? Is it exposure for their club teams? Is it pride in their 
their heritage? Like, what have you found to be the, the priority in recruiting these players? Well, look, to be honest, and you know how this is right now. I mean, in, in right now in North America, especially in, in the U.S. section and Mexico, there's three, um, there's two national teams that are ahead of us, and that's the U.S. and that's Mexico. So when you have kids that are born in the United States from parents of Salvadorians or a dad is Mexican and a, a mom is Salvadorian, then it is difficult for us to be the first choice. And that's the reality. So what we're trying to do is, one, I think also, it, it all depends on the situation of those players, if they have ever been called to their to the U.S. or Mexican national team. Not everyone is going to be called, you know that. Because I still feel that at the end, coaches choose whatever type of player they want in the way they play. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they're bad just because they don't get selected by Mexico or the U.S. And then we know about that. But what we're trying to do is basically be transparent and tell them the truth. Look, we understand that you guys have another choice. If they choose you, well done. You know, if they don't, we feel that you guys are good enough to play for us. And I know your dad or mom are Salvadorians, and also they'll probably be happy to for you guys to play for us. And at the end, also, I think we speak to them about exposure. It doesn't matter what national team you play in, but for example, you're right now competing in the World Cup qualifiers. If a kid has not been chosen by any of the two national teams that I mentioned before, why should they wait and lose the opportunity to, to be exposed to anybody in the world? And if they do well, I mean, doors open up. I always say this, that the national team is a place where players can be seen, have exposure, and migrate to other countries or other leagues. And that's the reality. I mean, it happened to me. Yeah. Um, I'm not just saying it because I say it, but I think that's the thing. And, and the last thing is we don't put any pressure on the families. I mean, right now we have two cases in the U.S. for us. One is Tomas Romero, who's a goalkeeper for LASC. He's eligible to play for the U.S., but he's, he hasn't been called. And yes. it's a, it's going to be hard for him to get called with all those young players, that goalkeepers that the U.S. has. Mm -hmm. And then we have another player. His name is uh, Brian Hill, who is of um, Colombian descent, and he's playing in Colombia right now. We've spoken to him about joining their national team. He was interested, uh, but obviously over there they're telling them, him that not to commit right now. Uh, but those are the cases that we're dealing with. So the only thing we can do is um, just be honest, transparent. The door continues to be open. Um, I don't really close the doors to anybody because it's not an easy decision. And, you know, in the days we're living yeah. right now, people have agents and the agents tell them probably, hey, don't go to El Salvador, okay? You know, away from Mexico, <laughs> away for the U.S. But the reality is that there's thousands and thousands of players that could be representing any of the three countries. So we just feel that the only thing we can do is be honest with them, explain to them um, where we're at and where we're going, and then they have to make that decision. Yeah, and I, I imagine that that's a large part of your strategy going into 2026. But yes. maybe if we could just take that quick step back now that, so you've, you've coached at a USL level and um, some of the youth national teams for the, for the US but this is really your first full managerial role for a national team going through qualifying. If you could just reflect now that you've been kind of 90% through the, the qualification rounds, mm -hmm. what have you kind of reflected on in terms of maybe it's your own coaching style, how you've led the team or how you've selected the players? Well, look, um, I think our country has been in issues with football issues, administrative issues, players' issues for so many years. So when we came in, obviously I 
I retired here 25 years ago when I was playing soccer. And I know mostly the system, how things work. We're not a very organized country. Our quote unquote professional teams are not really professional. Um, so the only hope for our players here is the national team. Mm. So what we've done when we came in was to bring back respect, to, to, to have commitment from the players, uh, to have the players be disciplined on the field, off the field. Those things were not there when we came and, it has, and they have not been there for the last 40 years. That's the reality or else we would have had a better chance to qualify. And then you have the issues with the club. Sometimes they don't want to let you players for micro cycles uh, that we want to put. But we're trying to fix that, okay? And when we got into the octagonal, we came in and they were still fighting to get in and fighting with the islands. Uh, we were struggling a lot that we would go and play an island, it would be a tie or we would lose one zero. So coming in, I knew because I was here also. I, I don't know if you knew, but I was with the under-23 national team mm -hmm. at the beginning of 2021. And uh, that gave me an idea of the type of players we had and what we had to do in case they would give me the job for the senior. I didn't think it was going to come that fast, to be honest with you, because I talked to the president. And I told him, look, let the coach who's here finish his, you know, his contract. Mm -hmm. And if you still think I can help you, then we can talk. But I don't like to talk about contracts when you have already people working. But something happened in April, and um, they parted ways. So they asked me to take over. We knew coming in it was going to be difficult because you don't – you're competing at countries that have been in World Cups the last 40 years. And in Central America right now, if you make a, a number from one to six, I think, you know, we are behind Costa Rica, we are behind Panama, we are behind the U.S., Canada, Mexico. And it's it's not easy to come in when you don't have no base, when you, ha you don't have any work done before. But people sometimes here in our country think, okay, in six months we can get a good team and then we'll qualify. Uh, it doesn't happen that anymore. Uh, there's a lot of other things involved. So we knew it was going to be difficult, but the important thing for us and what the president told me was, look, let's get into the octagonal. It's a big thing if we get in. We haven't been there for the last two of years. So it'll be important. So we got in. And then coming in now, that we're almost done with three games left. When you, when I make the assessment of what we've done, I think we've taken uh, important steps, not big enough to qualify or to be in the uh, in the forefront at least uh, to qualify in fourth and then you know fight against New Zealand yeah. or something. Yeah. But also, it has been a wake up call for this country um but knowing my people believe me when you're here it's like you're either good or you're not good you either <laughs> no and that's the reality and, and the biggest problem we have here is that they don't see the reality of of the real football because they don't go mm -hmm. out you see what i mean yeah and that's been the hardest thing for us and then after on the football side we, we, we realized that we couldn't play the way they used to play, which was a lot of long ball, very defensive uh, minded, because also there was a fear of losing a, by a lot. Okay. Yeah. And I think sometimes also coaches that have come here, uh, what's been important for them is win at all costs because that's going to open the door for me to go somewhere else. And that, I think, this is my personal point, it has uh, 
the style, a system, players have been sacrificed for that. Okay? Because it's not the same to be an outsider than to be an insider. I was born here. And even though I played for the U.S., I always follow and had in my mind years ago that I wanted to help the country. Uh, not that I'm a great coach because I'm not. But coming in, I realized also that we had to change our style, the way we train, um, to be able to compete. Now, I always tell our players in, in the country, here, we're competing now, but, but still we haven't learned how to win big games. And then after that, when you learn to do that, then you have to be consistent. But in order to do that, you have, a, you have to have a base. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you look at our roster, we have three guys in the MLS, okay? guys in the USL, one guy playing in Europe, and, and the rest are nationals. Yeah. So, so when you compare Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., and sometimes Costa Rica, 60, 70 percent of their team is playing overseas, which is yeah, in Champions League. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Imagine that, and then, and then we have to compete against them. And here are clubs in our country; they don't prepare the players the way they should because there's there's lack of money, there's lack of infrastructure. Um, but we've managed to change a little bit the the mind of the players. And we, we've noticed something. Every time we have more time to prepare, we go and, 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 and at least compete better. Yeah. Okay? So that's going to have to change going into the future. You know, I, yeah. I express myself that we need our players to leave the country and the teams here get upset because I say that, uh, but it's, it's, if we don't change that, and then we have to do a lot of other things, even 2026 is going to be difficult because yeah. you're competing, as you said, against players who are weekly playing in big games and training for a spot every week. Here, our national guys don't do that. Yeah. Our foreign Can guys, kind of a little bit, but it's not the same. I do want to ask you about that because I, you mentioned how much you paid attention to El Salvador when you were, even when you were playing for the U.S. And I don't know if you know, but in the U.S. sphere, a lot of people have taken notice to how you're managing El Salvador and your ties to the U.S. national team. So I just want to ask like a very basic question, but in terms of your future aspirations, I know 2026, and I can tell how passionate and prideful you are about helping El Salvador. But after 2026, do you have specific future aspirations or would you ever consider coaching the U.S. men's national team? I Look, I think realistically, um, I don't know if I have a chance to coach the national team, even if it was available. Right? Why do you say that? Because there's a lot of issues there. Um, and I don't know. Uh, you know, there's new people now in the Federation. Okay, and they have, for them, I think they have a list of other coaches that could coach a national team, and that's the reality. I played for the U.S. for a lot of years, um, but you never know, but I think, uh, I don't know how much of a chance I have, all right, uh, but would I be interested in the future? You don't close the door to that. Honestly, you yeah. don't, because yeah. I, I know the system. I know the players. I work with them. The ones that are competing now, you know, Pulisic, McKinney, um, Tyler, all those guys who are doing well in Europe. We had them when they were 14, 15, and I was their mm -hmm. coach. I mean, I know the system. I know how the U.S. things and works. Um, you know, if if one day it would open up, yeah, of course. I mean, it's a country that I played for. Uh, yeah. The country that gave me the chance to to play somewhere else, uh, but right now I think one thing that I I, I notice is, I mean, uh, the U.S. is doing better now in developing players and getting them out at young ages to Europe, and that just thinking about that that really helps the football in America. 
Yeah. I hope that they do well this World Cup because there's a lot of things that are going to happen in this World Cup. And Burhalter has a very good team, but they're young, so they have to be smart. Um, and I, I told Burhalter the last time we played against each other in, in the U.S., I said, look, you guys have a very good team. I wish you the best because, you know, when you have all those players with that potential and how good they are, that's a very enjoyable thing to have when you bring them and start competing, you know. So yeah. I told my I wish him the best, and I in, in my heart I really do. Um, can I, that's can I ask how you feel about, like, the young players being inconsistent? Because a, a lot of fans will look at our team and say, this is – this is, um, I guess, technically the the best team that we've ever had, or in terms of where they're playing with their clubs or Champions League, this is the best right. team that we've ever had across the 11, across the 23, this is the best team that we've had. But the results aren't necessarily showing up on the national team, where we're in a good spot, we're in second place, but a lot of fans will, want, will have wanted us to see us perform better against Canada or been in a, a safer position in qualifying in in the ocho do you think like it's a it is not an excuse but there's some validity to having young players that are maybe inconsistently performing on a national stage or should us fans be expecting more from across the 11 and across the 23 the talent that we have okay you have to realize something when you look at their roster right now it's a young roster most of them Except Brooks, I think, or I don't know if Tim yeah. Rim, but most of them have not been in a World Cup. Yeah, John Brooks and DeAndre Edlin have been, and Tim Rim have been the only players okay. that have so played you've got in the about World three Cup. of twenty-eight or thirty, whatever um, roster Berhalter has. So that's one thing, and I'm not saying because of experience. I'll be honest mm -hmm. with you. I think uh, knowledge is more important than experience. But the thing is, now these players have the experience of playing in big leagues in tournaments. But when you come to the to the World Cup, the qualifiers, it's not easy to qualify in CONCACAF. Infrastructure, bad fields, weather, whatever. And then the, the other thing is that they're so young, okay, that sometimes they're very eager to do a lot of things. Um, but I think in the U.S., I have to be a little bit patient with that mm -hmm. team. I, I, I don't think that team is going to peak until 2026. Uh, yeah. it, but it all depends also what they do in the World Cup. Okay? Yeah. Um, but I, I think they have, as you said, one of the best rosters in the history of our country. Yeah. Um, what, and what did you mean by uh, knowledge versus experience? You know how people think, well, you don't have any experience. Uh, yeah. And that's why you cannot coach or you cannot play at that level. I don't think it has to do with experience. It has to do with knowledge. Knowledge is more important than experience. If you have knowledge, you can manage things. You can have experience and still be failing. Okay? And it doesn't mean anything. But the knowledge of knowing what to do and how to do it is more important than uh, than uh what do you call it, than having experience. So going into the work of the U.S., if they prepare well enough and have a lot of knowledge of who they're going to play against, how they need to play against, I think the U.S. can, can go far. Awesome. So maybe let's talk about that coaching aspect and system a little bit. So I, I do want to ask you, this is a U.S. national team channel, so I'm going to yeah. ask kind of more directed questions towards the U.S., but... You were actually just in my neck of the woods a few weeks ago over in England visiting some teams. What was that experience like and anything new that you took away from the coaches and teams that you were visiting? Yeah, it's interesting you, you asked that question because we were at Leeds and then we were at Manchester City, two different clubs. One with a lot of power, one that competes to stay in the English Premier League. Leeds, great history, one of the I think uh, um, one of the clubs in, in England that really have 
a real support because it's the only club in the city. Yes, I understand. And the history is, is great. Bielsa, you know, with Guardiola, um, similar styles, but the difference is the quality of players. Manchester yeah. City has the best players, some of the best players in the world. Leeds has good players, but not compared to how Manchester City is. And the other thing that caught me was Leeds is a club that really is very careful in how they uh, bring players to the club because they, um, Orta, which is the uh, technical director there, mm -hmm. or sporting director, um, believes a lot in data, okay? And when I speak about data, they, they, they have it so well measured that they just don't get any player, even though he's good. He needs to have certain qualities according to the data they find out in, his, in the history of the player to get contracted by Leeds because they feel the English Premier League is not only the top league in the world, but... And with Bielsa there, if you remember, Bielsa, when he was there, um, the way they train, the way they play, it's a lot of running. It's a lot of up and down. They called so, it murder ball. Yeah. And, the practices. And, and, and because of, not because uh, just run and play, it's just that, that they're competing against other clubs that have better players. So it was interesting to talk to Orta when he said, look, we, we just don't hire any player, even if he's good. He needs to have certain qualities for him to come to our club. Then I went to Manchester City with, with, with uh, Leo, and it's the opposite. Leo doesn't believe in too much data. <laughs> He believes what I call the essence of football, mm -hmm. right? Technically, tactically, smart, okay, simple. I mean, when you when you speak to him, you can speak to him with him with hours and hours about football because he's so knowledgeable. But as much as knowledge as he has, he doesn't reflect it. You know, we spoke about things in, in Manchester City and you know, sometimes you, you wonder, I'm going to hear this about Manchester City, yeah? It's how awesome it is. None. <laughs> he was just telling us, you know, his feet on the ground. He said, look, I asked him a question. This is a funny thing. I asked him, you know, we asked him about playing out of the back, right? Tactically, and you want to yeah. hear what how they figure it out and everything. And he looks at us with the coaching staff and he says, look, it's very simple. Your defenders have to be better with the ball than the forwards that pressure them. <laughs> and then you can play out of the back. <laughs> so he didn't say, simple. look, you have to move these and here, here. No, he said, your defenders have to be better with the ball and they can play out of the back. <laughs> so, That's... but but again, you, you, you talk to him and again, going back to the two clubs, different clubs, but they have their own ideas and it's working for them. Although Leeds right now is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know Jesse March came in. I hope Jesse does well because he's an American and he's done well in Europe. And it's not easy to come into the English Premier League as an American, to be honest with you. I think Bob Bradley lived that. Um, and, and Jesse came in and, and it's a hard situation right now because they're fighting for relegation now. Yeah, didn't um, have the best result last night I know. either. They, yeah. they lost 3-0. But, but overall, look, we, we learned certain things that, you know, Leo was, years ago, he almost got hired here in El Salvador to coach the national team. Mm -hmm. um, so we were there, and then, obviously, we looked at their infrastructure and how they work and how they prepare the players. So that's going to help us now here. Because we're trying to change the infrastructure here also, mm -hmm. even our youth national teams. Um, and then we went to Spain. Okay, we're in Spain at the uh, um, Federation. And, and I think Spain is one of the best countries in the world as far as the football that they play. Yeah. And they have a different way of working, which we like. And then at the end, we went to Vitesse, 
at Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another also good club, middle of the table, good club, very organized. I mean, we like what they do there. Everything is, is very nice for the players. So we, we took out of those countries that we visit and the people we visit. I think there's a lot of things that we could use here. Not everything because we don't have the money they have. Uh, but, but for me personally, I had not been there for about seven years in Europe. Uh, I was there the last time when I was working with the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the things that we brought are going to be helpful for our program. Awesome. So you mentioned Spain's identity as a footballing nation. You mentioned Manchester City is more system oriented. So one of the one of the I don't know issues maybe isn't the right word, but issues that fans have with Greg Berhalter as the national team coach is his undying commitment to his system and what we feel is over his player pool. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask as a national team coach. Do you evaluate your talent pool and then choose the system or the other way around where you're choosing a system of how you want your team to play and then choosing players based on that? Look, let's talk about this because I think in, in soccer, everybody speaks a lot about systems. In reality, there's 10 systems in football. Okay. You break them down four, three, 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 four, three, three, two, one, whatever it is. But that's not the most important thing. I think the most important thing is the vision and the commitment and the conviction of the coach. Okay. What do I mean by that? For example, I put my, my example. I never liked to play long ball, you know, in the eighties and even at the, in, at the English league yeah. there, they used to play a lot of long ball. Cause I was there in, um, I had a try in Southampton, QPR, and believe me, I left a week, no, 10 days into it because I didn't like it. It was too much long ball, okay? <laughs> yeah. And I think every coach has a, 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 a conviction of how they want to play, how they see the football, okay? So I think the system is not important. The important thing is what's your vision of how you want your players to play? In other words, a style and when you choose that and you're sure about how you want that football to be then you pick the players because at the end I want to choose players that play a lot of possession but if they don't have the skills they only have strength and power it's going to be difficult so that means yeah. I would have to play another style and I think with the U.S. I would have to say that they have the players to play any style, okay? But it all depends how your um, uh, your conviction is. And that's one thing that I think sometimes the fans look and say, well, they're playing this system and, and it's not working. It has, I don't think, from my experience now in the World Cup qualifiers, um, Look, we play Canada, we play the U.S. and Mexico, right? Canada and the U.S. are a little bit similar in the type of players. But I think that the U.S. has more of a um, different style than Canada is. But the three of them, when we competed against them, we didn't think too much about systems. Okay, because people here in our country were saying, well, you guys were playing 4 3 3, now you're playing 3 5 2, or you're playing 3 4 3. No, we did that because according to what we saw that could help us have more possession and, and press more and, and play higher, we had to change a number of systems. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, we didn't focus on the system. We focused on how our players was, were going to be on the field and how we could press and have the ball more. So yeah. I think at the end, Again, my personal opinion is I think uh, you concentrate more on the style and then you pick those players that can play that style. Yeah. I mean, as an aspiring coach going through my licenses now, I could listen to you talk all day about this. <laughs> and like, I, I just love the way you're kind of simplifying things that maybe fans aren't thinking about a lot. So just a few last questions. When, 
So your results against the U.S. men's national team, you were home the first game in El Salvador, drew nil-nil, and you played a really tightly contested match in the U.S. that El Salvador lost 1-0. When you were approaching those games against the U.S., how, how did you think about approaching those games? And were there certain weaknesses that you were trying to exploit or certain strengths of El Salvador that you were trying to really um, benefit from? Yeah, we, we did. I mean, obviously, look, let's put it this way. Their roster with our roster, it's not comparable. So what you need to do also is, at the same time, psychologically, I was... um. In two, in December to two twenty, um, the U.S. played El Salvador in Fort Lauderdale, and I think it was their B team, as they call it, mm -hmm. some under twenty threes, and they got beat six zero. Okay, and I was looking at that game, and I was analyzing that game, and we were so slow, very late closing no possession at all. I don't think we look either fit enough. And we are talking about December, right? Um, so I realized, and I, I wish I, it, and I still hadn't got any job here. So, well, but I said, look, and that's embarrassed. I said, how can that happen to our players in our country is so bad? You know, if I could get a chance to coach them, I would do this, this and that. Coming in now, competing against them, we we knew we had to be fitter to run, to be more, uh, in other words, more dynamic to match their the way they play because they're fast, they're quick, okay? They're explosive. So we had to match that. So we had to prepare our players for that. And second, we wanted to press higher because you give the U.S. time to think and space they can destroy you. Yeah. And so those were the things that we were concentrating a lot, pressing, having the ball to attack. But also what helped us was we, I had time against the US, I think we had um, time, a lot of time to prepare, almost a month. In the second game, the same thing, three, three weeks. I don't think if we would have gone to Indianapolis, the way they train here in our country, we don't have a chance because the U.S. is too good in that. And so, but obviously there's other things that we need to learn because then you have the factor of certain players. I still believe that certain players in positions have to be talented enough to break any any style or system that the other team has. And I still think we're lacking some of those players with us. But as a whole group, I think we have been able to, to, to stand firm in Can the game against Canada, I mean, especially at home, I don't think we should have lost. But there's a penalty. They don't count on us. And then the counter 1-0. And then the second goal is a yeah. fluke. I know how it happens. But, you know, Canada is on a roll now. Nothing goes wrong. Yeah. With <laughs> they have luck on their side. Look, look what <laughs> happened to the U.S. I mean, I, I, honestly, when I saw the U.S. Don't the remind room, me. <laughs> the U.S. had more of the ball. But yeah. Canada, two counterattacks, and boom, goal. Mm -hmm. And that's the way football is. When, when the team is on a roll like that, it's hard to stop them. But I think <clears throat> at the end, our preparation, when, when we looked at them, we wanted to at least tell our players that they could compete because it was very devastating, the 6-0. Mm -hmm. uh, and by tying and losing 1-0 for us, not because it was a victory for us. No, it wasn't. But it was more of a mental victory, knowing that if we continue to work hard, we can give them a game. And I think that at least the players felt it was accomplished. Yeah, some building blocks for, for the future. Correct, correct. All right, I have one more question for you, mm -hmm. Hugo. Um, and this is a community question from the Discord. So someone in the community asked, the fans love to talk about the system, the, the style, the tactics, the lineups that are chosen. But I imagine that there are a lot of crucial decisions that aren't necessarily seen by the fans and that are made behind the scenes. Correct. So things like training regimes, building the best mentalities in players. So what is one of those main things 
that fans usually fail to consider, but managers know that it's really important? Um, there's a couple of things, I think. One, uh, one of them is, for example, when you have the type of players that the U.S. has right now, the most important thing is where can you fit them that they can produce more for you? That's one. And how much freedom you're going to give them to be creative? And how important it's going to be for them to be creative as a group first and then individually, okay? How committed they are. In the football that you play now, in the days that we're living, you can go back to 1974, Holland, okay? Mm -hmm. Total football. If you can accomplish those things that I just mentioned to you, then you can, you can have a chance to beat anybody. But the thing is, how do we convince those players that are playing in big clubs, big leagues, to play for each other, okay? And then also let them shine individually because that's the way it is. And that's the hardest thing. The tactical thing, you, you teach it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But when you have, when the players get that understanding, how good they are, but how good can they, how better they can be if they make their um, their um, the other players better, then you have something. Because um, I used to remember, you know, Johan Cruyff saying, "The hardest thing about football is playing simple." Mm -hmm. Okay, and it seems simple, but it's so hard. He said. Now imagine all our national team players from the U.S. right now. I mean, they have so much talent. When you look at it, especially from the midfield up, yeah, you have about 20 players that can play at any level right now. But the hardest thing is for Berhalter is to find a way that all of them can play for each other and make everybody else better. Then you have a chance. That's awesome. Again, I feel like I want to keep you on for a few more hours, but I'm going to let you go. Um, I really do appreciate the time, Hugo, and good luck in the next World Cup qualifying cycle. Um, the next three games, you're still alive for El Salvador, but especially going into 2026, I think everyone would want to see you and the team succeed. So thank you for your time, and I hope to have you back on the channel at some point. Thank you, Jake. Enjoy. Yeah.